This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Congress is studying how to change immigration policies in an effort to get more foreign students to stay and work in the United States. Many foreign students come for advanced degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math. But many are unable to get a visa to live and work here after they graduate. In 2009, foreign students earned up to two-thirds of the physics and engineering doctorates awarded by American colleges and universities. Xiao Qin from Beijing is studying for a PhD in computer science at Georgetown University in Washington. He says, obviously we prefer to stay here for several years. But if we cannot get any valid visa, we have to leave. So far, no agreement has been reached on how to stop this so-called reverse brain drain. The loss of highly skilled workers usually involves developing countries, losing them to wealthier ones. Critics say American immigration policies are too restrictive. Representative Zoe Lofgren is a Democrat who represents parts of Silicon Valley in California. She spoke at a recent congressional hearing. While we once asked the brightest minds in the world to come and make their homes here, we now turn them away. Having educated and trained the world's best students in our universities, we no longer welcome them to enrich this nation. Some companies, including Texas Instruments, say it can take 10 years for their foreign workers to become permanent residents. Darla Whitaker is a senior vice president at Texas Instruments. She says, this is not sustainable. It hurts our company and our industry, and it places burdens and stresses on our employees. The United States limits the number of immigrants from other countries on a country by country basis. Students from countries with large populations generally have to wait the longest for a green card or proof of permanent residency. A group called the National Foundation for American Policy says a highly skilled Indian worker could have to wait up to 70 years. Vivek Wawa studies immigrants who start their own companies. He says the United States needs to change its immigration policies. He says if we don't keep these people, if we don't compete, we're going to lose. We're going to become a third world country and they're going to become like us. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. We have transcripts and MP3s of our programs and now PDFs for e-readers at VOA Special English. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Electronic books have changed the way many people read for pleasure. Now, online textbooks are changing the way some students learn and some teachers teach. More than 175,000 students attend the public schools in Fairfax County, Virginia, outside Washington. Last year, the school system used digital books in 15 schools. This school year, middle schools and high schools changed from printed to electronic textbooks in their social studies classes. Luke Rosa is a history teacher at Falls Church High School. His students work on school laptop computers. He explains the idea to them this way. 
It's just like a regular textbook, except it's got it all online. Peter Noonan, an assistant superintendent of schools, says with electronic textbooks, publishers can quickly update the content. The world's changing consistently, and the online textbooks can change right along with the events that are happening. Online books also cost less than printed textbooks. Usually, it's in the neighborhood of between $50 and $70 to buy a textbook for each student, which adds up to roughly $8 million for all of our students in Fairfax County. We actually have purchased all of the online textbooks for our students for just under $6 million. Many students like the idea because it means they do not have to carry a textbook around. Also, they can write notes on their work and save the notes in their account. But one student complained that the internet connection does not always work. Social studies teacher Michael Bambara says the ebook he uses in his government class is better than a printed textbook. He likes the way it has materials for students with different reading levels. So a person can individualize their learning and I can individualize their instruction. But the students also need internet access when they are not at school. About 10% of students in Fairfax County do not have a computer or online access at home. Public libraries in the county have free internet. There are also after-school computer labs as well as computer clubhouses supported by the county. Other school systems in the area are considering online textbooks. Officials in Prince George's County, Maryland plan a test project next year. A survey showed that 40% of students there do not have computer access at home. We have a video about online textbooks at voaspecialenglish.com. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Pursuit. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report in Special English. Lebanon is a nation of many religious groups, Shiites, Sunnis, Druze, Maronite and Coptic Christians, Jews, and others share the land. But often there is tension and sometimes violence. Over the years, the differences between the groups have made it hard for educators to write a unified national history. An agreement in 1989 called the Taif Accord ended the 15-year Lebanese Civil War. The agreement called for the same civic education to be taught across the country. The goal was to increase national unity. But the effort to agree on one national history has failed. Most history textbooks in Lebanon stop in 1943, the year of Lebanese independence. The duty of teaching children about their country's recent history has fallen mainly on parents. That can increase divisions among the different groups. The Green Space School is an elementary school in Beirut. It is on the edge of Christian, Druze, and Shiite neighborhoods. The school's head, Maha Qasim, says these religious ties can make history lessons a source of disagreement. She says some lessons have to be changed to avoid arguments among the students. Syrian forces withdrew from Lebanon 
in 2005 after a 29-year occupation. A series of protests against the occupation led to the withdrawal. The protests were called the Cedar Revolution, but Lebanese school children may never read about the protests in school. A government committee recently decided to remove the words Cedar Revolution from the education plan for a national middle school history textbook. So without agreement, Lebanese schools often choose textbooks based on the religion of their students. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prisica. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Education Report. In the United States, about six out of ten students in graduate schools are women. The same is true of today's young adults who already have a degree beyond college. As a result, the Census Bureau expects that more women than men will hold professions such as doctors, lawyers, and professors. Men had faster growth rates than women in going to graduate school in 2009. Still, women earned 60% of the master's degrees. That was the level of about 90% of all the graduate degrees awarded. But a new report says the 2008-2009 academic year marked a change. Women also earned 50 and 4 tenths percent of the doctorate degrees. The Council of Graduate Schools says this was the first year ever that women earned more doctorates than men. The largest share of all doctorates that year, 42 percent, were in education, engineering, and biological and agricultural sciences. But the report says between 1999 and 2009, graduate enrollment increased in all subject areas. The fastest growth was in health sciences, business, and engineering. In 2009, graduate schools reported strong growth of 6% in first-time students from the United States. But enrollment of new international students decreased by about 2%, the first drop since 2004. The share of foreign new students in graduate schools fell from 18 percent to 16 and a half percent. In other news, President Obama marked the new school year in September with a speech from a school in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. President Obama told students they need to work hard in school because an education has never been more important than it is today. He said, the farther you go in school, the farther you're going to go in life. He also said this is a time when other countries are competing with us like never before. He said students around the world in Beijing, China or Bangalore, India are working harder than ever and doing better than ever. The president told the students, your success in school is not just going to determine your success, it's going to determine America's success in the 21st century. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can find our programs at voaspecialenglish.com and on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and iTunes at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. 
Getting a job can be especially difficult for someone with a prison record. So, a prison training program in the American Northwest prepares women to start their own businesses. The program is called Lifelong Information for Entrepreneurs, or LIFE. The training combines business and social skills. The women learn how to manage their time, set goals, and settle conflicts peacefully. Sarisa Whitley is serving five years for assault at the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, a women's prison in Oregon. She has a job waiting for her when she is released in January. But she also plans to start a small business with the knowledge gained from the months of class. She says she has learned a lot about how to write a business plan, how to communicate effectively, and how to listen. Another inmate, Cynthia Thompson, is serving time for stealing someone's identity. She says preparing inmates to become successful, accountable people will be good for the communities they re-enter. Mercy Corps Northwest started the training program four years ago. Mercy Corps is an international development organization. Doug Cooper is assistant director of Mercy Corps Northwest. He says, we were looking for ways that we could apply our expertise around economic development and small business management to populations that could use it. It's identical to what we do internationally. Mercy Corps Northwest has just started a life program at a women's prison in neighboring Washington State. Doug Cooper says he hopes the idea will spread to prisons throughout the country. The group says just three of the 100 graduates of its training program have returned to prison. Graduates of the LIFE program have started businesses like cutting hair and selling handmade crafts at farmers markets. One woman who served time for theft now runs an automobile repair business. Lori does not want her last name used. She says she worries what people might think if they knew she had been in prison. She stayed in contact with a Mercy Corps mentor after she left prison. Together, they found answers to questions about running a small business. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can download MP3s of our programs and find English teaching activities at voaspecialenglish.com. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Experts estimate that half of the 6,000 languages spoken on our planet will have disappeared by the end of the century. In West Africa, academics are trying to protect the language and rich cultural heritage of Togo. At the University of Lome, Professor Nbuike Adovi Goiakwe studies video of Gen cultural rituals. The professor is a cultural heritage specialist. He himself is a Gen, one of many ethnic groups in Togo. He has made films of Gen cultural customs with financial assistance from the United States. He says the Gen have an important place in Togo's history and culture. 
Gen rituals show how its people see their world. The interaction between the living and the dead, the seen and the unseen. The Gen believe in many different voodoo gods. But today, Professor Goiakwe says fewer and fewer Gen children go through voodoo initiation ceremonies. He says that increasingly, the new generation does not recognize the importance of these cultural traditions. He says formal education and the spread of Christianity have reduced their influence. Many young people think traditional practices are uncivilized. And while the Gen language is widely spoken in Lome, the professor says it is not taught in schools. Gen is one of about 39 languages spoken in Togo. Anahit Manashan is a language specialist with the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. She says a language needs people who speak it as their first language. She says a language needs people who can speak it as their second language. If there are not, she says, a language is extinct. She says languages can die as a result of increasing globalization. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Do American children still learn handwriting in school? In this age of the keyboard, some people seem to think handwriting lessons are on the way out. We asked a literacy professor at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Steve Graham says he has been hearing about the death of handwriting for the past 15 years. So, is it still being taught? He said, if the results of a survey we had published this year are accurate, it is being taught by about 90% of teachers in grades one to three. 90% of teachers also say they are required to teach handwriting. But studies have yet to answer the question of how well they are teaching it. Professor Graham says one study published this year found that about three out of every four teachers say they are not prepared to teach handwriting. He said some teachers teach handwriting for 10 or 15 minutes a day. Others teach it for 60 to 70 minutes a day. Many adults remember learning that way by copying letters over and over again. Today's thinking is that short periods of practice are better. Many experts also think handwriting should not be taught by itself. Instead, they say it should be used as a way to get students to express ideas. After all, that is why we write. Professor Graham says handwriting involves two skills. One is legibility, which means forming the letters so they can be read. The other is fluency, writing without having to think about it. The professor says fluency continues to develop up until high school. But not everyone masters these skills. Teachers commonly report that about one-fourth of their students have poor handwriting. 
Some people might think handwriting is not important anymore because of computers and voice recognition programs. But Steve Graham at Vanderbilt says word processing is rarely done in elementary school, especially in the early years. American children traditionally first learn to print, then to write in cursive, which connects the letters. But guess what we learned from a spokeswoman for the College Board, which administers the SAT college admission test. More than 75% of students choose to print their essay on the test rather than write in cursive. And that's the VOA Special English Education Report. This is the VOA Special English Education Report. The state of Florida is home to one of the largest populations of Haitians outside of Haiti. The city of Miami has a neighborhood known as Little Haiti. People who live there keep close ties to Haitian culture. Young Haitians can learn French at the Little Haiti Cultural Center. Haiti is a former French colony. French is the main language used in schools there. The center offers the classes through a nonprofit organization called the French Heritage Language Program. Not all of the students are Haitian, but for the ones who are, including Dominique Domond, the language has special meaning. He says, my mom speaks French a little bit. She speaks French and English. Marie Domond is Dominique's mother. Sometimes he says, Mom, I want you to teach me how to speak your language. Jennifer Linkletter teaches French at the Little Haiti Cultural Center. She says, French is part of what it means to be Haitian, and the goal of the program is to get them in touch with their French history and with their French roots and to be proud of that. Learning another language can also help them when they grow up. Martina Buissa is the Miami coordinator for the French Heritage Language Program, which is based in New York. She says, the more languages you speak, the more you can share, you can work. For work, it's very important. The organization has also helped expand French classes at Boyd Anderson High School in South Florida. About 25 Haitian earthquake survivors attend the school. The students were among thousands of Haitians who came to the United States after their country's powerful earthquake last year. One of the students, Kirby Edme, says, the teachers were very patient with us because some of us, we didn't speak English before we came here. Principal Angel Almanzar says there were also problems with lack of knowledge about the American education system and feeling isolated. Teacher Mathieu Dacan is himself Haitian. He says the classes have been good for the students from Haiti. It's like little Haiti within a school. This is where they feel at home. Many Haitian students in Florida say they want to help their homeland. Kirby Edme says, every Haitian, even if they weren't there when the earthquake happened, I think they have in mind to go and be successful and then do something for the country, even a little bit, because when it all comes together, it makes a big thing. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex.
This is the VOA Special English Education Report. Many new college graduates in the United States have trouble finding a job in the weak economy. But not graduates from the California Maritime Academy. The academy is the only school of its kind on the West Coast. Students attend classes on the university campus in Northern California. But they also gain experience by going to sea in a floating classroom, the training ship Golden Bear. 288 cadets recently sailed on a two-month international training cruise. The ship travels south to the Panama Canal. Along the way, it visits countries in Central America and the Caribbean. Vasile Tudorin is a mechanical engineering student at the California Maritime Academy. He spends much of his time working deep in the heart of the ship. He says he is not worried about finding a job. Robert Jackson is one of his teachers. He says the majority of the Academy's students have between one and two job offers before they complete their studies. He says most of those job offers are between sixty and one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. In addition to working on ships, he says, engineering graduates from the Academy also get jobs with power companies and satellite companies. Instructor Bill Schmidt says the situation for marine transportation students is not as bright as it was before the economic downturn, but it is recovering. He says most Academy graduates are employed in the industry if they want to be. He also says the coursework is demanding because ship's officers are almost like doctors for airplane pilots. He says people working in the shipping industry have to make the right decision all the time. He says a success rate of 70% is unacceptable. The California Maritime Academy has a 94 percent job placement rate. Still, only about 900 students are currently studying there. Cadet Andrew DeTucci says the Academy is different from a traditional college. It is a paramilitary school and the students must wear uniforms. Andrew DeTucci is majoring in marine transportation. He says when he was growing up, he was always told it takes a special person to want to go to sea for a living. In his words, my favorite thing about it is waking up every morning and seeing nothing but the ocean on all sides of you. I get a thrill out of that. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. From VOA Learning English, this is Education in Special English. Teachers say the digital age has been both a good and bad influence on this generation of American teenagers. More than 2,000 middle and high school teachers took an online survey. Researchers also spoke with teachers in focus groups. Three-fourths of the teachers said the internet and digital search tools have had a mostly positive effect on their students' research habits and skills. But 87% agreed that these technologies are creating an 
easily distracted generation with short attention spans. And 64% said the technologies do more to distract students than to help them academically. Many students think doing research now means just doing a quick search on Google. The Pew Internet Project did the survey with the College Board and the National Writing Project. A majority of the teachers came from advanced placement classes, which provide college-level work for high school students. Judy Buchanan is with the National Writing Project and a co-author of the report. She says digital research tools are helping students learn more and learn faster. But one problem the survey found is that many students are lacking in digital literacy. In other words, they trust too much of the information they find on the internet. Judy Buchanan says these students have not developed the skills they need to judge the quality or credibility of online information. They also say being able to quickly find information online hurts their students' ability to work hard to find answers. Many teachers are also concerned that the internet makes it easy for students to copy work done by others instead of using their own abilities. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti.